I'd like to welcome everybody who is here at White Park Street uh, Seminar. It's a great, great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Raph Babado back at the JCPA. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for being here. Very important and interesting subject, which is uh, campus activism. Uh, Dr. Medoff is, has just published recently a book called The Student Struggle Against the Holocaust, co authored with uh, David Golinkin. And he's going to address the issue of campus activism by giving a historical context, but also discussing what is going on today and, and in the 60s as well, and in the 1930s and during the Holocaust. Uh, Dr. Uh, Medoff is founding director of the David Weinman Institute for Holocaust Studies which is a research and public education institute based in Washington, D.C. And he is the author of 12 books about the Holocaust, Zionism, and American Jewish history. And I think out of the 12 books, uh, three of the books are, right, three of them? Yeah, on the table. Yeah, three of the, of the books are on the table on the back. So after the lecture, uh, Adam is going to help you if you are interested in any of them. Uh, and there's also a uh, publication on your desk. I don't know if I've done that one, but there's more copies up, up front here. So once again, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. And, uh, Thank you very much. It is a pleasure and an honor to be uh, to be back at the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. This is, I believe, my third lecture here in the last two years. Um, Thank you very much, Leslie Wagner, for, for hosting and inviting me, and Thomas, as, as always, for all your help. Very much appreciated. You know, although we are all overwhelmed by email, um, <coughs> I, for one, still get a lot of junk mail through the regular postal service every day. In fact, um, I imagine it's probably somewhat similar in Israel. If your name is on one mailing list, and they share the list or sell the list to other organizations and companies, so you start to get a lot, a very large volume of junk mail. And I get a lot of mail from Jewish organizations and Zionist organizations, sometimes four or five of them a day, uh, asking for money for various causes, some worthy, some less so. And in the last year or two, I've noticed that quite a few of them talk about what's happening on college campuses around the United States, about the proliferation of anti-Israel activity. And I know, of course, it's not a problem only on American campuses, but in, in Europe as well. In fact, I was just looking at the latest issue of the Jewish Political Studies Review, and um, I see there's, a, there's an essay about anti-Zionist activity on British campuses. And, and the opening line is, in the last few years, the last few years have witnessed an explosion of anti-Zionist rhetoric on university campuses across the United Kingdom. So it's everywhere. It's in Europe. It's in, it's in America. And the major, the major Jewish organizations in the U.S. have, have taken note and, um, and under, undertaken certain activities to try to counter, which I'll comment on, on later. But the point is that there is a, there is a serious problem. There are um, active anti-Israel groups on many campuses. I was reading recently that there are 17 campuses now, which every year have an Israel apartheid week, an entire week of activities on campus, accusing Israel of apartheid. Um, there are also a number of campuses that have Israel Occupation Week, which, which is essentially the same thing, I suppose. But, um, but, but the various radical groups, and these are typical radical left groups, which are hostile to Israel, constantly coming up with new ways to batter Israel's image um, and to try to undermine the morale of the Jewish, um, the Jewish students Zionist movement and Israel, broadly speaking. It's a concerted, organized effort to try to uh, harm Israel's reputation, and most of all, to put pressure on Israel, public pressure, economic pressure through the, the, the boycott and divestment movement, pressure on Israel to make more concessions to the Arabs. There's a certain irony in all of this, of course, because, as we know, the Israeli government, this Israeli government, um, and previous Israeli governments have gone much further than ever in Israel's history in terms of the concessions that they're willing to offer to the Arabs. And yet, precisely at the time when, when Israeli government proposals are, have, 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 have gone so far and offered so many concessions, the anti-Israel forces seem more frenzied than ever. It's a fascinating thing. And um, as a historian, what I've wondered about and what I've been uh, focusing on in recent years is 
how college students <coughs> responded to a very different crisis uh, back in the 1940s. I guess college students in general have a reputation now for being activists, and I, I suppose we, we sort of expect that if there's going to be divestment and anti-apartheid so-called and other anti-Israel activities, you're going to find it on campuses because students have a reputation for being demonstrative and creative and energetic. Um, and indeed, in the United States, of course, college students were very much at the forefront of, for example, the anti-Vietnam war protests in the 1960s. And, and, and on campuses you've, you've had, even beyond the Vietnam period, campuses have been centers of political activity on a variety of issues. Vietnam simply being the, the, the best known. And, and perhaps we might say that the protests against the Vietnam War were among the most influential um, of college, college student protests in American history. Uh, certainly, President Johnson's decision in 1968 not to run for re-election was heavily influenced by the massive outpouring of uh, anti-war protest activity on college campuses in, uh, in the 60s. But campus activism in America did not begin in the 1960s or even the 1950s, but actually began in earnest in the 1930s. It's not well remembered today for a variety of reasons. Mainly because, as you'll see, it became severely discredited by historical events. But there was a, a tremendous um, protest movement on American college campuses in the 1930s, uh, primarily over the issue of war. These were anti-war protests focused on the escalating tensions in Europe during the <coughs> mid and late 1930s, and the burning question for much of the American public of whether or not the United States should get involved was the European War America's business. This was an issue that consumed college students in the 30s. Partly, I suppose, because they were the ones who would be drafted and would have to fight if there were a war. So there's a, and it's understandable. I mean, and that was undoubtedly a motivation for some of the, of the young people who were protesting in the 1960s against the Vietnam War. They were next in line to be drafted. In the 1930s as well, students understood that if if a war, if America was to become involved in whatever conflicts were brewing in Europe, then they would be on the front lines. But beyond that, there was certainly a genuine uh, anti-war and to a certain extent genuine pacifist sentiment among many college students in America during that period. The, um, the organizing of anti-war protests in, on American campuses in the 30s was largely the work of communist and socialist students. Communists, the, the, the youth arm of the Communist Party, um, <coughs> the par and parallel arms of the, the socialist movement in America, were quite strong in the 30s, largely as a, as a, a response to the, uh, to the Great Depression. And the communists and socialists worked together, a kind of a popular front, um, both recognizing that college campuses were fertile recruiting grounds for students turn students against, against American involvement in, in Europe's affairs. Now, the, um, the anti-war sentiment that attracted students in the early 1930s, college students in America in the early 1930s, began to shift in the mid-30s and into the late 30s as the Soviet Union's attitude towards Nazi Germany began to shift, which is to say the anti-war movement on American campuses in its earliest stages was essentially a pacifist movement. The theme of the movement was keep America out of war, that, that Europe's uh, European fascism and, um, and the conflicts there, the beginnings of war there were not America's business. But as the Spanish Civil War heated up, and as the Soviet Union took a, a, you know, an active role on one side of the Spanish Civil War and the Germans um, side, you know, took the other side, uh, the Soviets began to um, realize that it would actually be beneficial to have um, the United States take a more sympathetic attitude towards helping, towards, towards opposing um, fascist, uh, fascist Italy and Nazi Germany um, and, and supporting the Allies. 
So now again, we're talking about the mid 1930s. So this is the period of um, Japan had already invaded China. The Spanish Civil War was at its peak. And the Spanish Civil War, by the way, in particular, attracted a lot of idealistic American college youth. There were quite a few young American college students who volunteered and fought in the famous Lincoln Brigade, um, fought on the, you know, on the against the fascists in Spain. And so although the, although the college protests against the war were very much against American direct involvement in the war, there was a softening of attitudes in the mid and late 1930s. And as I say, it followed the Soviet line because communist college students who were um, energizing, organizing the anti-war movement were essentially following the Soviet line. Um, in other words, very closely watching what the Soviet Union's positions on these issues were. Into the late 1930s, the anti-war movement on college campuses attracted enormous, enormous participation. When I say enormous, I'll just give you an example. In 1936, 37, 38, 39, each year, the anti-war students had a one-day strike, where on campuses all, all around the country, students, it was a strike against war. Students would, would, would boycott classes, they would have rallies and speeches and so forth. The first time that there was one of these uh, strike days, which I think was 1934, attracted a few thousand students. It grew rapidly in the mid and late 30s, and by 38, when these activities peaked, they had an estimated 500,000 students on campuses around the country taking part in strike in, in, in strike against war uh, activities. And, and this on this day, this um, day, day of strikes which was a number approaching half of all college students in the United States. So you get a sense of, of what, an, what a, a, an enormous movement this was, and the potential that it might have for influencing political opinion, political, uh, political process, and public opinion. And in general, public opinion in America in the 30s was, of course, very isolationist in any event. Um, but the, uh, the students reinforced this. The reason the anti-war movement fell apart um, in on college campuses was not, as you may you may have been um, supposing, um, the entry of America into the war in 1941. In fact, the anti-war movement collapsed two years earlier because of a very different event, event and that was the Soviet-Nazi uh, pact in 1939. When the Soviets suddenly reversed their position and instead of um, portraying <coughs> Hitler as evil, and portraying fascism as something that they wanted America to combat, all of a sudden the Soviets had a peace treaty with the Nazis. And this was impossibly, an impossibly hypocritical stand for college students to follow. The, the communist college students, the, the leaders of the anti-war movement on American campuses, all fell into line right away with the Soviet position. And they literally were in the, in the, in the, in the incredible position of one week urging action um, uh, international action, uh, action, sanctions, and 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 against against Nazi Germany, and urging aid to the Allies, and literally a week later, taking the position that no, America, um, American involvement in the European affair would be an expression, and European affairs would be an expression of imperialism, and um, and Hitler is not the problem, but imperialism and capitalism are the real problem, and America should should should, uh, should take a hands off attitude towards Nazi Germany. This was followed very shortly afterwards by the Soviet invasion of Finland. And again, the young communist students all defended the invasion of Finland and even made the preposterous argument that, in fact, the Soviets were simply responding to a Finnish provocation and that, in fact, it was self-defense against Finland. Um, and for, for the masses of American college students, this was just too absurd to follow. So the, the entire um, mass of students who had been active and energized and part of this movement, it disappeared almost overnight. The anti-war movement and pacifist movement on American college campuses was left with a very small number um, of, of, student, of student activists. I mention all this by way of background because um, the main focus of my talk today deals with a, a group of college students in New York City a little bit later, in 1942, and their efforts to organize a movement against the massacre of the Jews in Europe. So I wanted to set what happened in 1942 against the background of the earlier period. Our story, The Student Struggle Against the Holocaust, which has just been published two weeks ago, this is a 
for Randu, um, focuses on three rabbinical students in New York City at the Jewish Theological Seminary. At the end of 1942, when news about what we call the Holocaust, we call it genocide, but in those days those terms were not, excuse me, were not used widely, were not used. At the end of 1942, news of what they called the mass murder or mass extermination was the common term of the Jews in Europe, was publicly confirmed by the Allies. Until the end of 42, the news reports that were reaching the United States were fragmentary, they were considered by many to be unconfirmed, there were doubts that perhaps these were simply atrocity stories which come out of every war, and the American government, even though the Roosevelt administration, even though it had detailed information about the massacres, had been very slow to publicly confirm that this was an organized attempt at mass murder of all of Europe's Jews. But finally, at the end of 1942, so that's about a year and a half after the Holocaust began, with the Soviet invasion of with the uh, German invasion of the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. So about a year and a half after the Holocaust began, the Allies, the Roosevelt administration, the British, the Soviets, issued a public statement publicly confirming mass murder was underway. Our three rabbinical students, Noah Galenkin, Buddy Sachs, Jerry Lipnick, read about this in the newspaper. Literally, Noel Galinkin picked up the newspaper one, one morning in um, the end of November 1942, and there was the news. And the news was not on the front page, of course. It was during the Holocaust, news about the killings of Jews almost never made the front page. In fact, one of the books we have on the table for sale in the back is called Buried by the Times, and it's a study of how um, news about the massacres was, was buried in the back pages. It's not that it was um, not there. It was there, but it was back in the out of, you know, out of the limelight. It was almost never on the front page. But if you were interested, if you were concerned about what was happening to the Jews in Europe, and you made it all the way to page 18 or 24, as Noah Golinkin did that morning, um, then he found the news about the confirmation of the mass murder. Noah Golinkin's response, his immediate instinctive response, and perhaps it's because he himself was a re recent arrival, a refugee from Poland, his immediate response was, we have to do something. And this is, again, this is what we would expect from college students, but it was not true um, on most campuses in 1942. Uh, it was not even true at the campus of the Jewish Theological Seminary. It was not, in other words, there, were, there was not an outpouring of sentiment on campus or protest. These three students, interestingly, as I discovered in my research, they were very much isolated. Not opposed, not opposed. The administration did not interfere in their efforts to organize protests on this issue. But they were really just a, hand, just a very small handful of students who were sufficiently engaged and wanted to do something. So what do you do? What do you do if you're a, a young rabbinical student, you don't have the resources yourself to organize a movement? Noel Galinkin's instincts told him he should go to Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, foremost leader of the organized American Jewish community. Rabbi Wise was the head of the American Jewish Congress. He was um, leader of the American Zionist movement. He was a prominent figure in a whole, a whole host of other leading organizations. He was unquestionably the most powerful and influential Jewish leader of his day. And most, of, most, perhaps most important, he had President Roosevelt's ear, which is to say he had access to the president. It doesn't mean the president actually paid attention to what he said, but he was a Jewish leader who could get into the White House, who could speak to the president. And this made him, uh, this increased his influence uh, as a Jewish leader immensely. About a week after the news of the genocide was confirmed, Rabbi Wise went with several other um, Jewish leaders to meet with President Roosevelt, to discuss with him this awful news, and to ask the United States government to do something in response to the killings. Wise came out of that meeting with a, a very upbeat, kind of a um, very optimistic description of what the president's attitude was. He told reporters that the president was extremely interested, was um, a cared deeply about the plight of the Jews in Europe, and had pledged to do whatever he could to help rescue Jews from the Nazis. We know that that was, in fact, not the case. Noah Lincoln didn't know. 
that was not the case. We today know that was the case because the other Jewish leaders who took part in that meeting, one of them wrote a detailed account of the conversation with the president. And so we know, in fact, that Wise's description was way off base. Um, that Roosevelt, in fact, made no promise whatsoever to help rescue the Jews. That Roosevelt spoke in very, first of all, Roosevelt spent most of the meeting joking around. This was typical of FDR, by the way. When he we had a meeting and the people who were raising a subject was politically difficult for him, one in which he did not want to respond actively. Um, he would spend much of the meeting telling little stories, telling little jokes. When I was here six months ago, I was doing some research at the Central Science Archives, and I came across a transcript um, of a meeting that Nachum Goldman, head of the World Jewish Congress, had with the Jewish agency leaders here in Jerusalem in 1944. David Ben-Gurion and the other top leaders of the Yeshua were at this meeting. And Goldman came in from Washington. He was briefing, briefing them on the situation in Washington, the political situation. He told them, um, summarizing of course, um, that it was extremely difficult to have any influence with President Roosevelt. He said because it would take you months, takes months just to get, a, to get an appointment with the president. He says, and then when you come in, he says the president spends about the first 10 or 15 minutes telling little jokes and stories. And then he expects you to then entertain him for another 10 or 15 minutes with jokes and anecdotes and stories. He says, that leaves about five or 10 minutes to talk about what issue, whatever issue is left. And he said, in these circumstances, it's almost impossible to have any influence. So what Goldman is saying was clearly true of the meeting I'm describing in December 42, where Wise was telling them that Roosevelt was very forthcoming, and we know from the other accounts that, in fact, he was not. Noah Lincoln and his friends read in the New York Times an account of Rabbi Wise's account of the meeting. Um, and even though Wise had given this sort, of, this sort of very positive impression, what disturbed Lincoln and his friends was that Wise seemed to be emphasizing the issue of post-war retribution. The emphasis of the meeting seemed to be all on Roosevelt promising that these war criminals, the Nazi war criminals, will be punished after the war. When we win this war, they will be brought to justice. And for Galinkin, that was a very disturbing emphasis and approach, because what he and his friends felt was that the plight of the Jews needed to be addressed immediately, not at the end of the war. Because if, if rescue was postponed, U.S. action was postponed until the end of the war, how many Jews would still be left alive by that, by that time? So Galikin and his friends organized a delegation of rabbinical students, not just from the conservative seminary they attended, not just from the Jewish Theological Center, but also Orthodox students from Yeshiva College, now known as Yeshiva University, and Reform rabbinical students from Stephen Wise's own institute, which in those days was called the Jewish Institute of Religion. Today it's called Hebrew Union College. And they, they made an appointment to see Wise um, shortly thereafter. It was in mid-December 1942. It came to Wise expressing anguish over the situation of the Jews in Europe and with a, a list of ideas that they thought that American Jewish organizations and they themselves could help promote ideas for how the U.S. government might help rescue Jews. The first two proposals they raised had to do with finding a place of refuge. Where could Jewish refugees go for those who could escape? There were two proposals that had been raised in the United States, in the media, and by people in Congress and elsewhere in 1939, 1940, 41. There were two ideas that had come up and had been kicked around a little bit and had not gone anywhere. Um, one was to settle Jewish refugees in Alaska, and the other was the Virgin Islands. And the reason was because neither of these areas was a state. Um, Alaska at that point was not yet a state. The Virgin Islands is still not a state. These were both U.S. possessions, territories that belonged to the United States. And because they were not states, the immigration restrictions, which kept most Jewish refugees out of America, those restrictions did not automatically apply. Uh, they did not apply to these territories. So these ideas have been raised. They had one champion in Roosevelt's cabinet, um, the Secretary of the, of the Interior, Harold Ickes, that supported both of these ideas, but Roosevelt had rejected it because um, the president was adamant on not bringing any significant number of Jewish refugees into America's orbit, even if not directly into America, not even to American territories, because the president and the State Department feared 
that refugees might use the Virgin Islands or, the, or Alaska as a kind of a jumping off point, that they would start there, but then they would manage to get into America itself. And this ran very counter to the entire thrust of American immigration policy in the 30s and 40s, which Roosevelt and his State Department um, implemented vigorously. And that was to keep, um, a, to keep most refugees from reaching America's shores. Anyway, the students resurrected these ideas. The students said to Wise that, that they said, why don't we bring these, these ideas back up? Because there doesn't seem to be any other place where the Jewish ref refugees might go. When they proposed Alaska, Wise told them it was too cold. Too cold for these European Jewish refugees, not suitable. When they suggested the Virgin Islands, Wise said, yes, too hot. Too hot. Exactly, too hot. Of course, the problem for Rabbi Wise was not the weather. Um, the problem was that he was deeply loyal to President Roosevelt, and he knew Roosevelt had rejected both of these ideas, and he was not willing to promote or champion any proposal that he knew the White House frowned upon. The students um, made another, another proposal, a very interesting proposal, and that was they offered to organize a movement of college students protest against the killings and to raise public awareness and to put pressure on the American government to do something to intervene. What they suggested was that they could begin by going to other religious students, other seminary students, not just rabbinical students, but also, perhaps more importantly, Christian seminary students. Right across the street from the Jewish Theological Seminary, is another institution known as the Union Theological Seminary, which was in those days, and still to a certain extent today, um, was in those days the most prominent institution for training Protestant clergy. So these are the religious, the Christian counterparts to the JTS boys, right there, literally right across Broadway, right across the street. So they, they proposed they would, they would begin by mobilizing other religious students on religious grounds, on the grounds that this was a moral problem, a religious problem, not just for Jews, but for Christians. That Christians had a moral obligation to care about what was happening to the Jews in Europe. And then they said, we could branch out. We could, from there, we could then organize on other campuses and organize a national movement of college students to protest. Wise turned them down. Wise, did, wise told them, um, trust me, rely on me, as the leader of Jewish organizations and as someone who knows the president, I know how to handle this crisis. He was not interested in having in organizing a new mass movement, clearly one that he would be unlikely to be able to control. There was the danger, he didn't articulate this, but I'm giving you a summary of, of, of Wise's perspective. There was clearly the danger that these students might say and do things that he would be uncomfortable with. They might openly criticize President Roosevelt and the Allies. Um, they might do things that Wise would find embarrassing, that Wise feared would cause anti-Semitism, that would make Jews appear to be only concerned about Jewish issues and might make them seem unpatriotic, especially in the middle of a world war. So the, these, the students left the meeting brokenhearted because they went in there thinking that surely Wise would want to put them to work, so to speak. And they came out of the meeting empty-handed. To their very great credit, they did not take no for an answer. They went back to their home campus and they spent a number of long nights as college students do because these college students don't seem to get a lot of sleep at night anyway. Um, and talking about it, trying to figure out what could they do? What could they do? And they decided they were going to go ahead and form their own organization, start their own movement, wise or no wise, even though they had no budget, no staff, no secretaries, three kids and a typewriter. That's what it was. Three young seminary students and an old typewriter. But with a great vision, an idea, and a determination to try to do something at a time when most American Jews were really in shock. That's really the way to describe it. Most American Jews reading in the, in the newspapers, Stephen Wise can, and, and, and other Jewish leaders confirming that two million, two million Jews in Europe have been had been, had been murdered. For most Jews, it was just shocking and nobody knew what to do. And the mainstream Jewish organizations, like those led by Rabbi Wise, were not 
engaged in, in, in any significant public activity. There were a few rallies here and there, but nothing of significance, nothing ongoing. At a time when most American Jews were in shock and looking for leadership, who steps into the vacuum? But of all people, three young seminary students with a new organization that had a very unwieldy name. This is so th these are students who are not schooled yet in the art of clever acronyms and sound bites. And so they named their organization the European Committee of the Student Body of the Jewish Theological Seminary. But quite a mouthful there. But they, they, they set their sights right away on a very interesting and creative, a creative project. And that was to go across the street, meet with those Christian students who they didn't know very well, um, and try to get them interested in this problem. And before I, before I describe some of the things they did, without giving away the whole story, which is in the book, but before I describe the, the major activities and accomplishments of these student activists, let's talk for a moment about how realistic a proposal were they making? When they said to Rabbi Wise, could we, would you authorize us, would you work with us and allow us to organize a student movement? Was it, was it even realistic? This is the question that the historian has to ask because were they, maybe they were just, you know, another, you know, a, an idea without, that sounded good in, in, in theory, sounded good on paper, but could have really been done. I have described already how the massive college protest movement in the 30s had completely collapsed by the time um, America entered World, World War II. So there were no, there wasn't any organized protest activity of any kind. Once America entered the war, there were you know, no more than a handful of devoted pacifists or anyone protesting any further against American involvement in, in World War II. So Galinkin and his, and his fellow students were really looking at a kind of a, a barren landscape where there was no activity on campuses. Was, was it even, was it realistic in any sense? To get a better idea of what the possibilities were, I interviewed Moshe Ahrens. Why? What is Moshe Ahrens, the former amba Israeli ambassador to America, former defense minister, you know, foreign minister as well, one of Israel's preeminent elder political states, and what in the world does Moshe Aaron's have to do with this? Well, as I'm sure most of you know, Moshe Aaron's was born and raised in America. And in 1942, 1943, Moshe Aaron's was one of these college students in America to whom I've been referring. He was a student at the City College of New York. City College of New York was the intellectual center for student activism in the late 1930s, early 1940s. Most of this activism was, um, was the work of young Marxists and Trotskyites, most of them Jewish, Jewish. In fact, to such an extent that there was a, a pundit at the time who, who joked that, um, that New York City really um, um, was, in fact, um, almost a part of the Soviet Union. He said it was the most interesting part of the Soviet Union, the way he described it. Because so much, so much radical intellectual ferment in the city, and especially on the on the college campuses. But in addition to the to the Marxists, and the Trotskyites, and the various various, various Shachmanites and the various communist uh, factions on campus, there were also a number of Zionist factions on campus. There was an active group of Beitar students, one of whom, one of the, one of the leaders of whom was young Moshe Aaron. And while working on the book, I interviewed him, you'll see that, that some of this is, is described in the book um, about the situation on campus. And, and as he described it, there were, in addition to all the, the radical leftists, who, who he said clearly would not have been interested in the Holocaust, because they were all consumed in issues, in, you, know, you know, in other issues, in issues of uh, you know, imperialism and colonialism and, and obviously Marxist economic theory, and, and they had no time for the Jews. Um, <coughs> but you had on campus Beitar, you had Habonim, the young labor Zionist, you had Hashemir Hadati, the young religious Zionist, you had Hashemir Hatsair, the young radical left Zionist, and you had Avuka. Avuka was the National College Campus Movement of the Zionist Organization of America. But it, it happens that Avuka was very far to the left 
of the Zionist Organization of America, and there was a lot of actually tension between the the, the leaders and the uh, and the young young radicals of Abuka. Um, and looking back at the student publications, newsletters, and in some cases magazines that these groups put out, I found something very interesting. Okay, first of all, among the Hashemir Hatzair kids, forget it. They were only they, they too were so um, so wrapped up in, in other issues, um, and in, and and especially given credits, especially in their preparations for making Aliyah. For the Hashemir Hatzair students, the focus was completely on on building up. Eretz Israel through the, through the creation of kibbutzim and on their personal future. Um, and they had these training camps, farms, in the greater New York area where they were preparing for, um, you know, preparing for future life in Eretz Israel. But political issues was not something that would have um, brought, would, this kind of a, a political struggle would not have interested them. The Avuka kids, um, kind of the same problem. I found one, an article in one of the Habonim newsletters complaining bitterly that, um, that the Avuka students seem only to be interested in what was happening in India. There's not a political ferment in India. They said that's all they, they talk about is what's going on in India. They have no time for Jewish problems. But the Beitar, labor Zionists, and religious Zionists, and, and normally we would not think of the three of these in the same breath. You think of these are like rivals, especially between the Beitar and the labor Zionists, if you assume that they were enemies. And to a certain extent, their parent organizations, of course, were enemies. Um, but when you look at the Beitar and the Habonim publications, um, one is struck by the similarities. They're both, as well as the religious Zionist uh, ones, extremely critical of the Allies. Openly critical of President Roosevelt, which you did not find in the mainstream Jewish community. Critical of the British, very strongly so. Critical of Churchill for enforcing the white paper and keeping most Jewish refugees out of Palestine. Uh, and very critical of the Jewish leadership. Very, very strongly critical of Jewish leadership. And these are the three groups to, um, to whom Ambassador Aaron's pointed as potential sources of support for a broader protest movement. The JTS students might have, might have had some success had they been in a position, had they had the resources ultimately to go to the various campuses and recruit young people because you had the, the Beitar kids and, and the labor Zionists and the religious Zionists um, just itching, just itching for leadership and for a, a movement that would channel their energies into efficient protests. It never really happened in that way because unfortunately the JTS students didn't have the wherewithal, didn't have staff, didn't have the budget to organize the kind of movement that they hoped Stephen Wise would, would lead them in. But they did what they could. And here's what they did. They did two, two remarkable things, two very significant things. The first was they successfully enlisted the students across the street to have a public Jewish Christian conference about the plight of the Jews in Europe. Again, this is in early 1943, a time when there had been very little protest activity in America regarding the Holocaust. This was really a pioneering thing to have a to have not not only a conference but to, but to involve um, a strong Christian element in um, a conference focusing on rescue, not just a, fo a, a conference to mourn the loss of the Jews and not just to, um, to hope that the war criminals would one day be punished, but a conference focusing on practical ways to rescue Jews. The speakers of the conference, this was an all-day conference, speakers in it included some major Christian leaders, prominent American Christian leaders, several prominent Jewish leaders, a, a senior official of the Joint, for example, um, and of course the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Dr. Louis Finkelstein, who was a, an important Jewish leader. Varian Fry, interestingly, was one of the speakers. And those who recognize the name know that Varian Fry was a, a young American journalist who had gone to Vichy, France in 1940 and personally organized an underground network that had smuggled about 2,000 Jewish refugees out of Vichy, France, into Spain and Portugal and then to freedom. Varian Fry was one of the speakers at this conference, um, and he spoke, again, about the importance of focusing attention on practical ways. Where can the Jews go? How can they be rescued? What are the obstacles to overcome? What can the Roosevelt administration do in a practical sense to rescue Jews while there still are Jews alive to rescue them? The first half of the conference was held at Union Theological Seminary. 
second half, they went back across the street to the Jewish Theological Seminary. So it was a it was an important um, demonstration, first of all, of interfaith cooperation. Now, interfaith cooperation is one of those, one of those um, buzzwords we hear all the time. Jewish organizations are very fond of fostering it, and, and which is which is of course um, entirely admirable. But in this case, it was critically important for a political reason. As long as the Roosevelt administration felt that the problem of European Jewry was a Jewish problem, a Jewish concern, it had very little motive to take action. What I mean is, if it was only American Jews who cared about this, well, Roosevelt really had the Jewish vote in his pocket. And um, it reminds me actually of a, of a, a quip by the late Sidney Zion. Sidney Zion was a... Uh, a, um, a very fabrent um, Jewish columnist for the New York Daily News and other papers in the 60s and 70s and 80s. He passed away recently. He once wrote that um, about, about this very subject about Roosevelt and the Holocaust. He said, "When he said when people have the Jews in their pockets, they usually keep them there." Roosevelt had received something in the order of 90 percent of Jewish votes in 1936 and 1940, and so as long as FDR felt that only Jew, that this was just a Jewish problem. He was not going to feel much pressure to do something about it. But once he felt that there were Christians who cared, that there was a significant portion of American Christian opinion that wanted the Jews to be rescued, then there was the potential that something might be done. Obviously, American Christians represented a much larger number of votes than American Jews. Generally speaking, America's churches responded very poorly to the crisis of European Jewry. This is a topic discussed in some, some detail in the book. Our, our young unsung heroes here, the JTS students, um, set their sights very high. They understood, they understood, despite their youth and inexperience, they understood that it was critically important to get churches involved, to get Christian public opinion um, to care about what was happening. But it was a difficult task. They were able to get the Union Theological Seminary to host this event. That was important. And they got speakers of note to take part. And there were Christian students who participated. But beyond that, they found that it was very difficult to get any of the Christian, America's Christian organizations, church, churches, to take an active interest in what was happening to the Jews in Europe. The conference, though, served an important purpose in terms of getting that door open just a crack that somebody had to be the first to, to stand up and say, action must be taken. And the fact that they got Christians involved in saying was also important. So the timing and the Christian element were especially significant. Their next major project um, focused appropriately on trying to motivate mainstream American Jewish organizations to take action. This was where the JTS students had the best chance of success, because this was familiar territory. They understood the language. They were an important part of the Jewish community. These were the future, they were the future Jewish leaders. These are young men who in a year or two would be rabbis, and in three or four years would be, would have pulpits, and some of them would go on to become leaders of Jewish organizations. So, um, so they went to the Synagogue Council of America, exactly the right choice. The Synagogue Council of America was an umbrella group for all the, the, ma the three major denominations of American Judaism. In other words, American conservative, reform, and orthodox synagogues belong to the Synagogue Council of America. When I say orthodox, by the way, I'm excluding here the Haredim, because what we, in those days they weren't called Haredi, but I mean, they called themselves European-style or old-world-style orthodox. But I'll call them Haredim here for short. Haredim um, were not interested in having any cooperation with the non-Orthodox rabbis. So they were not part of the Synagogue Council. But the modern Orthodox, the people connected with the world of Yeshiva University, the Zionist, the Zionist Orthodox, um, they were part of the Synagogue Council of America. So our three students went and contacted the leaders of the Synagogue Council of America, had meetings with their leaders, brought to them the proposals they brought to Stephen Wise, but also created an entirely new proposal fashioned just for the Synagogue Council of America. Here's what it was. You know, there is a period between Pesach and Shavuot in which we have the Sfirah Omer, the counting of the Omer. And this Sfirah period is considered a period of semi-mourning. 
where traditionally Jews do not have weddings, um, other kinds of public festivities, and there are various semi-mourning uh, restrictions during, the, during those weeks. The proposal to the Synagogue Council of America was to use this Sphira period as a period to educate and energize American Jewry about the Holocaust. To use the fact that this is already a period when there is an atmosphere of semi-mourning, to capitalize that and turn it into religious and political action. The proposal called for synagogues around the country to hold rallies, to hold memorial services, special tefillot, to have partial fast days, to add, um, add lines in their, in, in, in their regular davening and in benching even, to remind people on a regular basis of what was happening to the Jews in Europe. To organize letter writing campaigns to public officials, to the president, to the state department, to the congressmen. To have a variety of, of activities that would change the mood in the American Jewish community. What these students correctly perceived was that American Jewry was mired in a kind of business, <coughs> business as usual atmosphere. And when I say that, just to give you an example, in, in, research, in doing the research for this book, I studied a lot of magazines, publications of the, of the major Jewish publications of the era. And among other things, I looked at the advertisements. This is something they taught us in grad school. Don't just read the articles, but also look at the ads to get a sense of what kinds of things were people doing, especially in their leisure time. I had hoped, frankly, that what I would find was a shortage of ads about leisure activity. As I was hoping I would, there wouldn't be too much of that because I was kind of, you know, looking back, thinking that, you know, millions of people being slaughtered in Europe, that that would have such a, a jarring effect on American Jews that the usual vacations and, 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 and activities would have been at a minimum. But in fact, I'm sorry to discover that the Jewish magazines are filled with ads for all kinds of um, Jewish vacations and resort hotels and all kinds of, kinds of leisure activities that you would expect in normal conditions when things are proceeding as usual, but of course we know, and they knew. It was not a time um, when the Jewish world was proceeding as usual. The Jewish world was, in fact, on fire. And it was, for me, it was, it was, I found it very troubling to see that, 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 the, that the usual atmosphere, the daily atmosphere, did not seem to be interrupted to any significant extent. This is what the JTS students mm -hmm. realized when they were trying to figure out how to respond. They saw around them people acting as if things weren't that much different. So the whole idea of the Sphera project was to change the mood, change the atmosphere in the Jewish community so that people would care, and if they cared, then that they might act. Happily, the Synagogue Council of America <coughs> saw the value in such a program. You might say, as I wondered to myself, how is it they didn't think of this themselves? Why did they need three rabbinical students to come to them and propose it. But look, that's how it happened. That's, that, that was, that's history. Nobody at the Synagogue Council of America thought of it. These three students did. The Synagogue Council of America created a special committee to implement the Sphera program. And in, during the course of the spring uh, of 1943, they sent out thousands of packets of material, step-by-step -step guides to creating Sphera memorial and intervention, they call the intercession, intercession activities on behalf of European Jewry. And synagogues responded. Synagogues responded. Many synagogues around the country, major cities, small cities, had rallies, they had letter writing campaigns. I don't know how many of them wore black ribbons that were included in these packets. The Synagogue Council of America manufactured little black ribbons and pins which the students designed, and urged people to buy them in bulk from the Synagogue Council and to wear them on an ongoing basis. It's not clear to me how many people went that far, but we do know that in many, many communities, there were special tefillot, there were different kinds of rallies and, other, and, and, and protests and uh, petitions and other sorts of activities. So in terms of educating American Jewry, this was an important step forward. There was little hope of real political action and organizing real pressure on the White House until people cared, until it became an issue. Those of you who um, recall the 
the Soviet Jewry protest movement in the United States in the 1970s and 1980s you may recall that uh, among the features of the Soviet Jewry campaign were small things, things like people wearing little metal bracelets that had the name of a prisoner of Zion on them, or having an extra a chair at the Seder table, an empty chair for the Soviet Jew who could not be part of it. Different kinds of activity, activities that were intended to raise awareness, to make the problem of Soviet Jewry something that people heard about every single day. At uh, Kehillah Jeshurun, the, uh, one of the main Orthodox synagogues in Manhattan, there was a, a marquee on the, um, I mean, you know, outside the synagogue which during the years that Natan Sharansky was in prison in the Soviet Union, every week they would say how many Shabbatot Sharansky has still been in prison. So that every time a worshiper walked into Gilad Jeshur, they were reminded Sharansky is still in prison. By the way, they have, they have, they have, after Sharansky got out, then I don't know who the next person was that was on the marquee, but now for some time it's been Gilad Shalit. So they cannot forget Gilad Shalit any time they walk in the front door of that synagogue. And that's the kind of activity keeps the issue foremost in people's minds and ultimately, ultimately can lead to people actually doing something about it. This is what our young pioneers at the Jewish Theological Seminary had in mind when they, when they proposed the Sphira campaign. And, um, and it was as successful, I think, as it could have been in terms of raising the awareness of the Jewish community, of making rescue a major issue on the American Jewish agenda. It was all too easy for American Jewish organizations to get wrapped up in other issues and other problems. Remember, this is a time in American Jewry when, for example, the issue of Zionism was the subject of all-consuming debate. Zionist, non-Zionist, and anti-Zionist groups were constantly fighting over questions of Zionist ideology and the value of Zionism and the future of Palestine. And there were other issues, too, that consumed American Jewry that, that could have distracted, as the times did, distract the Jewish organizations from the most burning issue of that era. And reform and conservative and orthodox groups are constantly quarreling over various theological issues. So it was all too easy uh, for Jewish organizations to get distracted and for rescue to drop down on the agenda. So the importance of the Sphira campaign was to keep rescue up at the top of the agenda in order that something might actually be done about it. The Sphira campaign, interestingly, included a second element, and that was aimed at America's churches. So in addition to sending these packets of material, these step-by-step -step guides, to synagogues around the country, the Synagogue Council of America managed to convince the Federal Council of Churches, which was the major umbrella organization for Protestant churches throughout the United States, convince the FCC, um, that it should do a similar mailing, mass mailing to churches, urging them to take part in a specific day of protest, which they called the Day of Compassion and Intercession. It was set for May, in May of 1943. And the proposal was to have um, as many as possible rallies, events, memorial services in churches, and to have cooperative events where local synagogues and churches would join together to show that this was a Again, an issue that was not just a Jewish issue, but something that all decent people should care about. That was the, the goal. Sad to say, very few churches took part. And just by way of example, um, in Pittsburgh, in Pittsburgh, one of the local Jewish organizations um, wanted to help publicize the fact that churches would be doing this. So a few days before the day of intercessions, um, a publicist from one of the local Jewish groups began calling churches to find out which, which of, what kinds of activities they were having. Um, and throughout the course of an entire day of calling churches throughout the city of Pittsburgh, could not find one church that was planning to have any kind of activity in connection with these events. In Boston, where there are many, many churches, in Boston, local Jewish organizations um, financed a a, a big publicity campaign in which they, first of all, they enlisted the governor and U.S. congressman from the Boston area to sign a proclamation urging participation in the, in the event, in the day's events. They sponsored ads in the subways of Boston and in, 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 in elsewhere across the city, posters, 
urging people to take part. Um, in the end, only eight churches in the entire Boston area, out of, out of hundreds, um, had any kind of, either had a ceremony or at least their clergymen took part in one of the Jewish rallies. So, generally speaking, the Protestant response um, was extremely weak. And that was a major disappointment. Um, and it's, it's an important subject, which has not, by the way, been adequately researched. We have, in the last 10 or 15 years, a lot has been written and published about how Americans respond to the Holocaust. Much of my work is focused on American Jews, as with this book. Professor David Wyman, after whom our institute is named, um, was the author of the, the most uh, important book about the American government's response, and that's the, the book, The Abandonment of the Jews, which some of you may, may, may know. Um, as I mentioned before, there's been work done on how the American media responded, such as the New York Times. But interestingly, very little research has been done on the response of the American churches. And, and I very much hope that, um, that the younger generation of scholars will begin looking into this in, in a more comprehensive way in the years ahead. Um, but we begin, we've begun to talk about it in this book. Um, but in this book, it's in the framework of, of students and of the Synagogue Council of America trying, but unfortunately with very limited success, trying to arouse uh, Christian responses. So what did these students achieve, and what, what can we learn from their experiences? Some of the lessons from this book are, unfortunately, all too familiar, starting, of course, with the shortcomings of mainstream American Jewish leaders, of leaders like Wise, who were either too loyal to Roosevelt, or too afraid of making waves, or just too stuck in their own business-as-usual way of responding to, to um, crises, but to respond more effectively. This book, unfortunately, just further illustrates that sad pattern, that sad phenomenon. But there is, of course, a, a, I don't want to say positive, because when we talk about the Holocaust, nothing can really be said to be positive, but there is a, there is an important lesson, and in some ways perhaps it's a little inspiring, I hope it will be. Um, to realize that there were students who did care and did try to make a difference. Because in every generation, we hope that the, the next crop of young leaders, young Jewish leaders and leaders for society in general, will be people who will stand up. We're hoping that, that the, the next group of young people will not, will not be bystanders, but will be upstanders, will stand up, will be willing to say or do things that are unpopular if they're morally necessary. Uh, on today's college campuses, um, there are efforts, of course, in many, many, many universities by pro-Israel students to um, to combat the anti-Israel propaganda to which I refer. I guess one of one of um, the hopes of my co-author and I in this book is that students today will look back to the example set by Noah Bo Lincoln and Buddy Sachs and Jerry Lipnick, and to derive from that um, some strength and inspiration about the importance of standing up for what's right. Because on the college campuses today, of course, pro-Israel students are heavily outnumbered. Um, you have a, a relatively small number of pro-Israel students, you have a larger number of uh, radical anti-Israel students, then you have a lot of students who are just somewhere in the middle, either not well informed or not particularly concerned. Um, and there's a battleground. There's a battleground of uh, there's a battle of ideas underway for the hearts and minds of those of, of the students in the middle, many of them Jewish, who do not know enough about Israel's plight to um, to appreciate and understand why the arguments of the anti-Israel students are wrong. And more broadly speaking, I, I, I hope as well, of course, that students will um, we'll see these students' response to genocide <coughs> as a lesson for responding to genocide in our own era. Because, of course, today's students live in a world where genocide is still alive and well, where you have ongoing genocide in Darfur with Arab militias massacring uh, black tribesmen. You have, of course, threatened genocide with 
Ahmadinejad in Iran preparing nuclear weapons, and of course not just the Iranians, but the Syrians obviously were well on their way to developing nuclear weapons before Israel wiped out their uh, nuclear facilities a couple of years ago. So the Jewish people today live very much under the threat of uh, future genocide. And when you have a, leaders of Iran, leaders of Hamas, openly, openly threatening to destroy the Jewish people to commit genocide. One would hope that the response of at least a small number of people to genocide in those days might offer lessons to today's younger generation. Some Jews were rescued as a result of American intervention very, very late in the war. What happened, kind of at the end of this story, after these students had done pretty much what they could to arouse public opinion, to alert American Jews. After that, later in 1943, another activist group, larger, better organized, um, known as the Bergson Group, <coughs> stepped to the forefront and began to arouse public opinion in much more substantial ways by taking out ads in the newspapers, by organizing a march to Washington, 400 prominent rabbis in the fall of 1943, by lobbying Congress, by doing a lot of things that college students were not equipped to do. And the college students played their role in terms of helping to mobilize public opinion. And the Bergson Group played its role by, um, by undertaking various kinds of political action that they were particularly skilled at doing. Again, to the chagrin of Rabbi Wise and mainstream Jewish leaders who found these kinds of forthright protests, these loud newspaper ads and rallies, um, to be discomforting and something that might arouse anti-Semitism and certainly would arouse the ire of President Roosevelt, as indeed it did. But the lobbying that the Bergson Group undertook in Congress had a very important impact at the end of 1943. Because by, not, by the end of 1943, the tide of the war had turned. There was no longer any doubt that um, the Allies would win the war. And as a result, many members of Congress were much more sympathetic to the plight of Jewish refugees and much more willing to consider doing something than they were earlier in the war. So the Berkson Group proposed a resolution urging the president, when I say propose a resolution, what I mean is they convinced their allies in Congress to introduce a resolution calling on President Roosevelt to create a new government agency specifically devoted to rescuing refugees. This was a, a radical idea because until this point, the State Department was in charge of, of rescuing, or in this case, refusing to rescue refugees. The idea was to get around the State Department by creating a brand new government agency. Um, the Roosevelt administration bitterly opposed this proposal, and the State Department lobbied against it, and the Bergson people and their allies lobbied in, lobbied in favor of it. And fortuitously, right at this time, senior aides to Secretary, Treasury, Secretary of the Treasury Henry Morgenthau discovered quite by accident that top officials in the State Department had actually been suppressing news about the Holocaust. And obstructing, interfering with opportunities to ransom and rescue Jewish refugees. So it was not only that the State Department was turning a blind eye, but that it was actually interfering with chances to rescue Jews. And these Treasury Department officials decided to blow the whistle on what the State Department was doing, which is, hence the title of another of my books on the table in the back, Blowing the Whistle on Genocide. They prepared a report exposing the State Department's actions. The report was taken by Secretary Morgenthau to Roosevelt, presented to Roosevelt, together with a plea to do what Congress was calling for, create a government rescue agency. And this is January 1944. So President Roosevelt, very well aware of the political calendar, that is to say that he would be up for re-election in 10 months, decided, almost on the spur of the moment, when presented with this report, and aware of the ferment in Congress, and pressure from Congress to do something, decided that politically, the simplest thing to do at this point would just be go ahead, create this government agency, and get all the refugee advocates out of his hair. In other words, the Berkson Group, thanks in part to the spade work done by these students, the Berkson Group had, had rallied enough public pressure and public controversy and 
noise in Congress that made it politically uncomfortable for Roosevelt to do nothing. And so he did something. By executive order, a few days before Congress was going to vote on this resolution, he preempted them. And by executive order, created a new government agency called the War Refugee Board. Now, government agencies normally receive government funding. Uh, yet, astonishingly, the War Refugee Board received almost no government funding. It was almost entirely funded by the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, by the Joint, and by the World Jewish Congress to a lesser extent. But fortunately, the staff of the War Refugee Board was drawn largely from the same Treasury Department officials who had blown the whistle on the entire scandal in the first place. So what you had was a small government agency, but run by very creative, devoted people, not Jewish. These are Protestant attorneys who really cared about what was happening to the Jews in Europe. And during the last 15 months of the war, they devoted themselves to rescuing Jews. And what they did, obviously we don't have the time to go into the entire story, but what they did is they thought outside the box. This is exactly what our college students did. They threw away business as usual and the usual ways of helping refugees. And instead what they did is they took, they took the money they had and they used, they sent it into Europe they gave it to underground groups to shelter Jewish refugees. It was used to bribe Nazis and collaborators to turn a blind eye to rescuing refugees. It was used, among most notably, most notably, it was used to finance Raoul Warnberg's entire mission of rescuing Jews in German-occupied Budapest. In fact, it was the War Refugee Board which sent its emissaries to Sweden to find Warnberg, to find a man to do this. It was they who convinced Warnberg to go to Hungary and it was they who financed this entire operation. So what we're looking at here ultimately is a chain of events. This is always a, the case when we're looking at, this, at, at the history. You have college students doing what they could. The Bergson group doing what they could. The Treasury Department guys doing what they could. And all of these factors combining ultimately to create a government agency and to create conditions which ultimately made it possible for someone like Raoul Wallenberg to do the heroic things he did during the last months of the war. Historians estimate that the activities of, of the War Refugee Board ultimately played a central role in rescuing about 200,000 Jews. Which to me is a remarkable number. For those in the War Refugee Board, when they were interviewed, um, excuse me, after the war, for them was a very disappointing number. And they spoke about how it was just a drop in the bucket. And if, they had only, if, they, if their agency had only been created six months earlier, how many more people they could have rescued? Still, still, to think of 200,000 people who were rescued as a result of some people, uh, some Americans finally protesting, to me it's an extraordinary accomplishment. And, um, and hopefully, as this story becomes better known, hopefully the, the lessons of this student struggle will inspire a new student struggle today by young people to do the right thing. Thank you, and I think we have time for some questions. Yes, sir. Uh, just for a second. Oh, okay. Let me take that minute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Justice Yeah. 
Am I clear in what I... Uh, no, I'd like you to be a little more specific on the second question, but I can even, maybe I'll go ahead and answer the first. Okay. Um, let me make a more specific suggestion about what might be done. Um, I was very pleased to learn not long ago that, um, that the mainstream Jewish organizations in the United States have created an umbrella group, a coalition, that they call the, uh, the Israel on Campus Coalition. And you see on their website, I think there are 33 groups that are members of this coalition, all the groups, um, all, all, all the major Zionists and Jewish groups are part of it, from right to left. Peace Now is part of it, and, and people on the right are part of it. Um, um, so that was a very, I was very glad to see that, but when I was looking on their website recently, um, I discovered to my alarm that the website had not been updated since last May. So a, a coalition that was obviously created with the best of intentions um, to meet something which is an urgent problem, and which in these mailings that I keep getting, where they're asking for money for, to meet the emergency, suddenly we have an emergency that seems not to have been addressed in the most obvious way, for something like six months. Um, it occurs to me that some emails to the Israel Campus, um, the Israel, uh, Campus Coalition groups might stimulate them to, to use this resource more powerfully and more, more effectively. In other words, you would, you would assume that you know, a website like this would be updated almost every day because there are things happening at campus constantly and there's a need for action on specific campuses all the time. If they are, don't have anything new since last May, I think it's a pretty sad commentary on the state of, of activism among the mainstream Jewish organizations. I'd say, let's start with that. They've got the, the mechanism is in place. They've got a coalition. All the Jewish groups are, 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 are signed on to it. Their names are there, but their names are there on something that, that hasn't been changed since last May. There's, so there's one idea. Now, for your second question. Second question. Go ahead. Uh, there seems to be an anti-war sentiment in the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, get out of Afghanistan, get through all the promises that are long made about getting out of different uh, Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think I don't think it's true that there is a widespread anti-war movement. It, it may be true that among college students, if that's what you're speaking about, but in terms of public opinion, um, I, as far as I understand from, from the polls, there's still very strong public support for American military action against terrorists abroad. Um, and I, 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 there's no, there's no anti-war movement pressing for, for the U.S. to pull out of Afghanistan now. Okay. I mean, among the intelligentsia, you know, there are some critics, but there's no, there's no substantial movement as I understand that. Jeff? First of all, Rafi, I want to uh, thank you for that, uh, that remarkable presentation. Um, you mentioned that uh, the three rabbinical students reached out across the street to the Union Theological Seminary. Uh, you mentioned City College uptown. Uh, but I'm just wondering, uh, was there any outreach uh, to just two blocks further south to uh, what's my alma mater, Columbia College, and I ask this within the context of uh, the efforts underway uh, by various student groups at Columbia to protest Murray Butler's invitation of Hans Luther, the, in 1933, the German ambassador at the time, uh, to Columbia. I ask this in the context of the protests, the strong protests that were launched by these student organizations. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the student leader at the time, Robert Burke, on campus against um, uh, Columbia's uh, sending a high-placed delegate, a uh, highly-placed delegate, uh, to the University of Heidelberg in 1936 for their 500th anniversary. Uh, there was a tremendous uh, student protest movement underway at Columbia College during the 1930s. Did they reach out to them? And if they did, was there any response uh, to that outreach? They did not. Um, our JTS students did not um, undertake an effort to mobilize on the campuses. They, they, the extent of their activities was determined by the fact that they were just three kids without any real resources. And so they focused their energies first on the conference that they prepared and then on this work with the Synagogue Council of America. I can tell you, by the way, I've looked at the, um, the Columbia student newspaper, The Spectator, for those years. I didn't find anything um, in the 40s referring to the plight of the Jews in Europe. I didn't see any interest whatsoever. Um, the protests you referred to in, in the much earlier period, for example, the protests against the visit of the German ambassador, Hans Luther, that was 1933. Um, so there was, there was some anti-Nazi activity, let's call it, uh, at Columbia in the earlier period. I couldn't find anything uh, during the Holocaust years, sadly. 
Justice. Justice. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk. One thing which I observed personally as the student at Berkeley during the 1970s uh, was that there were a tremendous number of Jews who were active in all range of humanitarian, human rights, political causes, but too many of them w were, were hopelessly on the left or on the right, mostly on the left, but they, they, they didn't take, if, and you can look at other colleges like uh, in France, uh, Danny the Red in 1968, in, um, in Colum at Columbia, Mark Rudd, uh, probably if, if, you, if you look at the range of people in activist capacity in that period, they, they would have been 80% Jewish, and, and, but, but almost none of them having to do with uh, Zionism or Israel or Jewish, Jewish survival. How can you explain that? Well, let me preface my response by saying, although you and I have never met, I'm a great admirer um, of your own work. Um, and your expose of Edward Said is, is, by the way, exactly the kind of thing that Jewish students on campuses need to be reading. Because that's the kind of material that really exposes um, the Arab propaganda forces. And Said, of course, at Columbia, undoubtedly did enormous damage over the years in terms of influencing students. So just let me, first of all, thank you for your tremendous work in that area. Um, how do I explain the, um, <laughs> the, the, the phenomenon of Jewish college students and their, and their involvement in the left? I'll tell you, I would need an entire lecture. I mean, we need an entire separate seminar, don't you think, to, uh, to address that. Um, this is a subject that has, has bedeviled and embarrassed American Jewry from, for as long as I can remember. Because um, it always seems that way. It always seems that when there's some kind of a radical outburst, it always seems to be the Jewish kids involved. It's certainly true with, you know, if you think of like the leaders of the Yippies, you know, it's always, it's always Hoffman and Rubin. And, and, and by the way, and, and um, of course, not always, but uh, it's astonishing how often the Jewish names pop up. Um, I've heard explanations. I mean, there are a lot of you know, different like, sociological explanations. And I've heard explanations about um, that kind of run like this, that Jewish students tend to be um, more idealistic and more interested in, in, you know, in movements that can change and repair the world. And I'm not going to invoke you know, some tired cliche like tikkun olam, but, but, that, but, that, but that the idea behind it, the idea that there are ways to make the world better um, and it's within our grasp, that for some reason, these kinds of ideas are, um, are particularly attractive to young Jews. I don't know, it's, by the way, it's something I've wondered about on a personal level because um, my grandparents were, um, were, were uh, radical left Jewish refugees from Russia who were so enamored of the Soviet Union in the 1930s that they quite nearly went back to, to the Soviet Union and only didn't, um, thus sparing me a life of growing up in the Soviet Union, only did because because a relative of theirs was uh, a highly placed official in the, in the Soviet finance uh, ministry. It was a, one of the deputy ministers of finance. Came here in the mid-1930s on a, on a visit um, as part of Roosevelt's improving of, of trade relations between America and the Soviet Union. And was shocked to find my grandparents literally packing their suitcases, planning to go back. I told them, what are you, crazy? You don't go back. There are, there are, there are purges underway, and, uh, and there are going to be show trials. And he begged them not to go back. And sadly, he himself, just a year later, even though he was such a devoted communist and a, and, a, and, a, and a Soviet government official, he himself was was arrested, he was purged, and he was executed by Stalin. Um, so in my own family, I'm well aware of this phenomenon. I, 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 something I could never really understand. Um, is, I think, of course, there's been a very gradual um, phenomenon of disillusionment among American Jews with regard to the, the very far left, so only the Soviet Union, because of the persecution of Soviet Jewry especially. And yet, and yet, the, the prominence of, of, of young Jews, we see them even on, among, among anti-Israel activities um, on campuses today. So there's no, there's no easy explanation. I think it's the kind of thing that is going to um, trouble us and make us wonder for a long time to come. I, I have a feeling, though, that you might have an interesting explanation of your own, um, which I'd be willing, you know, I'd, I'd be delighted to hear um, if, if Thomas will give us enough time. Very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you think the answer is? I, I don't know, gr group uh, psychology, it's not my field, 
it's it, it's certainly a phenomenon that we can all agree exists. It can't be a coincidence, right? It, it exists over a long period of time in, in multiple parts of the world. Mm -hmm. But you know, people maybe maybe the place to begin figuring this out is to to look at the uh, at, at the um, disillusioned American uh, Jewish college students, including my father, in the late 1930s, who was tempted uh, to go off to the Lincoln Brigade, in in and he he used his decision. He he explained his decision decades later to me by saying that uh, he he made the right decision and he made it because of the disillusionment with the Ribbentrop, Molotov, whatever the name of that agreement was, mm -hmm. where the Russia and or the USSR and Nazi Germany came together. That that convinced him not to go off to Spain. And he used it as an argument for me not to uh, go up to Canada uh, uh, or, or think about alternatives during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not a, it's not really an answer. Um, and I, I thank you for the uh, very generous remarks, uh, s suggesting that I, I might have something. But mm -hmm. it's it's certainly a phenomenon that deserves a, a lot more thought. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think it's not just students, but also faculty. That, uh, That's a good point. Yes. We have two more questions and I have to close the list because uh, time is up. But okay, uh, I think Dr. Mello will stick around for a few minutes if anyone wants to approach him. And uh, uh, you know, there's a book source there for Sia. Yeah. So first Professor Israeli and then uh, John Ronstein. Well, I, I have a, a couple of uh, points I'll try to make them very short. Uh, the first one, I start perhaps from the end, uh, is uh, the question of uh, uh, activity on campuses. I just happened from my own experience, last year I taught on an American campus and I encountered for the first uh, the first uh, uh, occasion in my life uh, th that kind of experience. I was very often invited and I often went without being invited to the, the local um, meeting of the uh, the uh, Muslim Student Association. No. Uh, and what is interesting, it's not simply a coalition of the left, extreme, radical, whatever. Uh, very often, this whole affair was initiated, in my experience, by the Muslim Student Association, which, as I learned, consisted both of local American Muslims, black or otherwise, but especially from the thousands, but thousands upon thousands of Muslim students who come from Muslim countries, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia and the like, who can pay for them the full tuition, and the universities, of course, cannot renounce that because they, are, they, they use them or, and they need them. Mm -hmm. And in those meetings, it's uh, simply stunning. Only by being present you can believe that. They invite many students to come, uh, first of all, there is catering. Very, very... Free food uh, always helps with students. Exactly. Exactly. Students hungry at the end of the yeah. day and so on. They start with a very rich buffet. Every one of them is, uh, is uh, registered, uh, all the details, and they make sure that they have their email and uh, that they come back and when, where can they come then and so so forth. It's really amazing. And then, after they say their words of whatever, they have a central figure, like an imam who comes from San Francisco mm -hmm. and he gives, uh, let's say, an expert delivery about, uh, about the, uh, the peace-seeking in Islam, all kinds of nonsense. Fortunately, that's my field, so I could at least argue uh, with them and so on. They were very angry at me and they interrupted me and so on and so forth. But most of the students don't know what it is all about. Uh, and therefore, I think it's erroneous to go into uh, under the impression that that's the left, radical left. Mm -hmm. If the Muslim Student Association, uh, of course, financed mm -hmm. by the Saudis and others, mm -hmm. and who can gain through various means 
the support of all kinds of students. And just before I left the campus, but not, not because of that, has nothing to do with me, the, the head of the Muslim Student Association was elected as the president of the Student Association of the campus altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, to show you the kind of, of popularity they, they can attain. And that's one. Secondly... Thank you for that. That's very interesting. Very well, uh, uh, yeah, I think it, I thought it would, be, it would make sense to your dream. Uh, second uh, remark is that uh, you mentioned that um, uh, you, you were sort of amazed that uh, during the war, uh, or, or you were disappointed to find out and so on, th that uh, people didn't think so much about rescuing other Jews, they were busy with uh, their own agenda and so on. And I think that, of course, uh, maybe at that time it was new for you, but it has become a pattern, because I remember all the dire periods of Israeli history, mm -hmm. when it was uh, outcast and during 67 wars uh, and 73 wars and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, according to the, uh, to the um, uh, polls that I, I read about American Jewry and so on and so forth, the question of Israel, uh, and I was no longer disappointed anymore, the question of Israel came out uh, fifth after the, the vacation in the Catskills, after the, the yacht in the marina, after the vacation to Spain and so on, and then Israel. And, and therefore, I'm, uh, and, uh, and you know that most of American Jews never even come, came to Israel. And therefore, the, you should not be surprised. M maybe then you were, but, but it has become, unfortunately, a pattern. And, and lastly, the question of the, uh, you said something about uh, when Israel made uh, uh, the concessions and so on and so forth, the Arabs uh, became tougher and, uh, and so on, and you seem like surprised from that kind of attitude because you expect Israeli concessions bring about uh, concessions on the other side. And again, that also has become a pattern where we remember very well. After Oslo, after the, those fools who signed Oslo, came back and they were surprised to discover that terror started there. So that's exactly the point, mm -hmm. because they realized uh, exactly the, the project, their own point of view on others. They make concessions only when they are hard pressed. Mm -hmm. If the Israelis are so hard pressed as to make concessions, they are at the weakest point, and that's the, the, exactly the time to beat them. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason after also there is terrorism, uh, after uh, we evacuate Gaza there is Hamas, and it's a repetitive uh, uh, pattern that mm -hmm. we should no longer be surprised about. But before, before you, I think we have one more question, but before yeah. that, um, let me just um, take a page from the, the Muslim students, and just as they always get everybody's email address, I'm going to pass around a pad. If anyone wants to be added to the Wyman Institute's email list, I promise not to clutter your box with with uninteresting emails, but occasionally we send out stuff like that. I don't share the, your list to the not organization. Unless you share with nobody, it's just to occasionally be notified if we have an event in Israel or some other interesting activity of ours. So if anyone wants to be on this, please let me have you email address. Uh, my, my question has to do with uh, Stephen Wise, who uh, in the eyes of many people is a hero of American Jewry, and for my uh, historical research is actually the villain uh, and uh, should be uh, sort of exposed for so many of the things that he did to the detriment of the American Jewish community. And I'm just curious how Congress met you with this concept of debunking the previous generation and so forth, and nobody has come out um, to show all of these uh, very serious, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say crimes, but very serious uh, missteps that Stephen Wise did uh, many of which uh, were uh, had to do with promoting himself as a uh, representative or as the representative of the folks in the American Jewish community. I'm just curious why nobody has said Stephen S. Wise exposed this thing. The process of, of historians completely revising their understanding of a, of a major figure, it's a long and slow process. Um, especially in the case of Wise, who okay, well, I would not describe as a villain in the sense that um, it's not a black and white. Well, at least that he knew what was best for the Jewish community. Well, no, but what I mean is this. 
Um, he's correctly regarded by historians and by American Jewry as someone who built, built um, important Jewish institutions, contributed to the American Jewish community in significant ways, um, was a leader of Zionism at a time when it was extremely unpopular in the reform movement, of which he was a, a member, um, to be a Zionist. Um, and you know, he had a, a record of achievements which, uh, understandably, built for him a reputation as, as a, a, a leader to be admired. Um, Wise's failings during the Holocaust um, only gradually came out um, in research done by historians in the last few decades. Uh, Wise, um, like a number of American Jewish leaders, wrote a kind of a self-congratulatory autobiography, which helped set, <laughs> helped set the tone, I think. Um, so it's true that Wise was very good at self-promotion. Um, in fact, there's, a, a, there's an anecdote about Wise's ego, which is worth repeating. It has to do with Wise first met uh, Sigmund Freud. And Freud asked Wise who he considered, who did Wise consider to be the four or five most um, important and influential Jews in history. So Wise said, uh, he said, he said Jesus, uh, Marx, uh, Moses, Solomon, and there was a fifth. Um, and Freud said to him, you, you didn't include yourself on that list. I mean, you're a leader of all these Jewish, Jewish organizations, such an important figure in the American Jewish world. And you, didn't, you didn't include yourself. And Wise went, no, 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 no. To which Freud responded, if you had said no one time, I would have believed you. When you say no, 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 no. <laughs> so and I think Freud uh, was dead on him. He got him. Um, so it takes a long time for someone who was up on a pedestal to be really be dethroned. I think research about Wise mm -hmm. in recent years has portrayed him in a more negative light, appropriately, um, without casting him as a villain, because as I say, I don't think it's a black and white situation. But he's someone who, in a given situation, did not rise to the occasion. Because of his political loyalties, um, because of a vari variety of issues, um, he did not meet the challenge. And I think what we'll find is that gradually that will come to be the consensus of historians, as it is today, increasingly, the way in which Wise is regarded. Yes, it will this, take time. I just first wrote more experience with Wise, where he, uh, you overheard before I was talking yes. about tonight. Uh, sort of like a pattern of his thing that he knew was best for people right. and didn't care who he stepped on. But, uh, but I mean, look, see, see that's, that's kind of a broad judgment. I wouldn't generalize to that extent, but, uh, but a lot of the things, mm -hmm. a lot of the aspects of his career where he clearly, clearly did not rise to the challenge, I think that will become more. Um, more clear in histories of this period that are written in the years to come. I think mean, the younger generation of scholars are not awestruck by Wise as, as some of the earlier generations were. I think they will be able to look at him more objectively. Is Certainly in this book, as you'll see, we, we look at Wise. Is that with, uh, and so forth? Too. That's, and that's part of it. You know, Wise's treatment of dissidents, including these student dissidents, is something which is only coming to light more recently. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, we yeah, hope to have you back again next year. Perhaps a little bit of a new book. There's always another one on the episode. We hope to see you again. Thank you very much.